Left the big city for the simple country life Found myself a woman that it took for me to be my way I was working on the ground come the sun up to sun time What's up everybody? Uh, today I am flying solo. There is not any Chris with me this time around. Um, taking a little bit of a road trip, heading myself up to Washington, D.C., Maryland, actually, um, just on the border of D.C. to visit my dad. And um, yeah, so we're gonna check out some, some sites in D.C. I used to live there, so um, I've seen a lot of them. I'm trying to find some that aren't. We're probably gonna hit some monuments. To be honest with you, we're probably gonna hit some monuments. Uh, but I have a couple of other things I wanna go check out, some interesting things that I'll show you guys. And um, yeah, I'll see you when I get there. So I'll probably be picking up this video actually tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, on my way to DC and um, I'll see you in the morning. It's the next day. I made it to Maryland. I'm staying with my dad who is driving this vehicle. This is him. This is Dr. Raymond Fuentes. Yo, yo. Say hello. <laughs> uh, we are going to hit some points of interest in DC over the next couple of days. Um, and I was trying to find some places that weren't the same places that everybody goes. We're going to go to some of those too. But we're I'm going to mix in some things that, that not everybody knows about. So if you ever come to the Washington, D.C. area, maybe you might consider checking these places out. The first place we're going to go is a place called Gravelly Point Park. And it is a park right at the end of the runway of, um, it's Reagan National, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Reagan National Airport. And you can go into this park and you can, if you want to, lay on the, on the grass underneath and watch these planes, these low-flying jets just come and take off right over your head. It's a pretty cool place. Um, so we're gonna go there right now and we'll pick up when we get there. <laughs> it says here on the sign not to feel the wildlife because it says wildlife can pose a significant hazard to the aircraft, especially birds, yeah. to help protect both the wildlife and aircraft departing or approaching Ronald Reagan National Internet. Is this international? I thought it was national. Uh, it's international, huh, okay. Um, it used to be Reagan National. Maybe they changed it. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, so they're saying don't feed the birds because I guess it'll bring them in and then they can fly up and get caught up in the plane and cause some problems with the plane and obviously it'll kill the birds. So, word of the wise, if you come out here, gravelly point, don't feed the birds. So there's the end of the runway there. And then here is the park. There's a Washington Monument out there in the distance. And we are just waiting for a plane to come in. How often do you say they come? Maybe every 10 minutes or so? One, as we were pulling into the parking lot, one flew right over the top. One flew right over the top. And uh, so we missed that one, but we're waiting for the next one either to take off or to come in. So here it comes right over the top. Look at this. <laughs> so cool. Okay, here comes the next one. It's coming in right from right from right over there. So we come right over the top here. I love this. I used to do this when I was a kid. I used to live here when I was when I was much younger. We'd come out here and lay right there, like a lot of these people are doing, lay right there on the on the ground and just watch these planes come in. This is Gravelly Park, where we're out here watching the, the planes come in. 
and right here is the Potomac River and across the way out in the distance you can see the Capitol building the dome of the Capitol building and then right there that dome over there is Jefferson Memorial that's Jefferson Memorial right the dome right there mm -hmm. and then right behind it you can see the Washington Monument is there so we're gonna we're gonna go get much closer to those uh, here shortly either today or tomorrow or before I leave um, but yeah this is if you ever come to the DC area this is a great place to just come out spend the afternoon bring a picnic bring the dogs bring your bike and watch these planes come in all right this one's coming in from we're taking this one from more of a side angle What do you think? That is so cool, isn't it? <laughs> it is cool. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, last one of the day. I'm like a little kid. I don't want to. I don't want to leave. I just want to keep. I sit here all day and watch these things come in. It's just. It's just fun. His dad getting his footage. <laughs> He's got to start his own YouTube channel. So here we're coming up on Prospect Street. This is this house right here is 3600 Prospect Street. And if you ever saw that old movie, The Exorcist, that was filmed here at this house. And um, let me see if I can get across the street here. So you can see the house right there. It's just more it's kind of a block it looks like kind of a square rectangular looking house but back in the uh the day when they filmed that movie there was a wing of the house that extended out this way it was torn down later on and uh years and years and years ago i actually had the opportunity to speak with the people that lived here and ask them uh, why it was torn down but they weren't really able to give me an answer <clears throat> but the house was torn down you can I don't know if you can really see where it was kind of broken off right there, but it, it used to extend out this way. And if you ever did see the old movie, The Exorcist, there was a scene in there where the preacher, um, what was the father? Do you remember the preacher's, the father's name in that one where they flew him out the window? Uh, no. I can't remember the name of the, the, the priest, the priest that they, that they, uh, uh but anyways, so at the at the the end part of that movie, where this um, house extended out to, the 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 girl who was possessed by the the demon threw him out of the window, and he fell down this staircase here. This is a very famous staircase. I don't want to be you know. I don't want to be rude and film too much of this but anyways um so yeah he was flung out the window there came out the window landed on the landing here and then he tumbled all the way down the staircase down at the bottom let me take a walk down there this is a very uh, steep staircase actually it goes up uh it goes up very um, dramatically or quickly, I should say. When I was a kid, I used to live here and I was in high school, uh, my freshman year of high school. I used to row crew and for, for the high school team. And we would come down to the boathouse after school 
and we would go ahead and um the boathouse i believe was about if i remember correctly it was about maybe half a mile maybe three quarters of a mile down this street here and then down on the water you can see the, Pot the potomac river right there down there on the water and before we did our workout on the river we'd have to run from the boathouse to this staircase and run as you can see this guy up and down the staircase here 10 times up and down man that is steep holy moly that is steep just basically straight up right there up and down the staircase 10 times then back to the boathouse and uh, then we'd be out on the water for a few hours so right here going across this, the the right the, that area over there is known as Rosalind and that bridge that's going from the Georgetown area here into Rosalind is the Francis Scott Key Bridge um, it connects basically it connects the DC area to Virginia because that is Virginia right there you can see the the planes coming into Reagan National which we're or international now which we were at earlier today um, but yeah I spent a lot of time down here as a kid rowing the, the boats down there on the water and running but yeah this staircase always just I mean, you can see it from here how how absolutely steep that is it's unbelievable that I, I mean I couldn't do that in this day and age <laughs> there's no way in hell I could run up and down this thing ten times now but yeah kind of a fond memory and another funny thing too is that when when i was a kid some uh somebody got the idea to come down here and paint the outline of a body like a chalk mark <laughs> down here so <laughs> there was a body painted on the ground down here and i think it was supposed to represent that uh that priest that came down the stairs but yeah you can see my my dad and the runner that was coming up and down the staircase up there chatting this is a very cool place i always like this place if it's one of those places it's kind of like you know it's not one of the super touristy places in dc but if you ever get the opportunity to come here and check it out if, if you like the movie if you like that exorcist movie um this is kind of a neat place you know that movie was based on actual events but um just so that for clarification it didn't take place here it was uh, in another state as a matter of fact um but it was filmed here this is where the this was the filming location for in fact the, the entire filming location i think for the most part of the exorcist there was some beginning parts um that weren't if i remember it's been a long time since i've seen it but anyways anyways cool place it's in georgetown and if you're having trouble finding it there's the francis scott key bridge it's right at the end of the bridge as you're coming over the bridge you look straight ahead and there it is right there you want to come over here and be over here? All right. He <laughs> wants to be. Wants to be YouTube I, I, famous. I want to be. I want to be in, in YouTube. Right. Are you um, kidding me? Of course. All right. So today we've arrived at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. Hazy? Is it Hazy? Okay. Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, and this is a part of the National Air and Space Museum which is in downtown Washington, D.C., but that is currently closed due to uh, the COVID pandemic. But this one is not. This is a 760,000 square foot, AKA 17 acre facility that houses um, some pretty impressive aviation history. So we're gonna go in and take a look. I'm not gonna tell you what's in there yet. We'll just see it as we see it. Yeah? All right. Ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> this is Stephen Udvar Hazi. He, he's the gentleman who this facility is named after. And uh, basically, what he did was he donated quite a bit of the money to, to make this, this place possible. $65 million he gave to build this facility. So, hence the name of the place, Stephen F. Udvar Hazi. So this is a pretty big place and just like in the National Air and Space Museum downtown uh, there are some pretty I mean they have they hang real planes from the ceiling just like the little kid might do in his bedroom so these are some of the toys they hang <laughs> hanging from their ceiling <laughs> fighter jets that's a Corsair okay. yeah that's a Corsair right there and there's a helicopter hanging over there we're just walking into the place we're just getting a our first look at it. 
But uh, yeah, look at all these airplanes just hanging from the ceiling like toys. Oh yeah, check this out. This is an SR-71. It's a reconnaissance plane. I was just reading that the SR-72 is in development and will be available around 2025. I want to get down there and take a look at that. Down on the lower level here, you can see the, uh, the SR-71 that is now housed here at this particular facility. This was a stealth reconnaissance plane that was, that was a top secret plane back in the day. I believe this is capable of traveling at Mach 3, which is three times the speed of sound, I think it is. I believe that's what a Mach is, is the speed of sound. So this SR-71 was capable of traveling from Los Angeles, California to Washington, D.C. in 1 hour, 4 minutes and 20 seconds. That is 2,124 2, miles per hour. It looks like Mach 3 was the, Mach 3.3 was the top speed. Top speed was 3,620 miles per hour. That is insanely fast. Wow. One of the main reasons why I wanted to come to this uh, this museum here, um, as soon as I saw it online, I was like, we got to go check this out. This is a very cool, very cool piece of history. And if you guys aren't familiar with this place, um, I'm going to turn around and show you what I'm talking about. This is the Space Shuttle Discovery. It's just sitting here. Anybody can walk right up to it and check it out. Let me come up here around the corner here. Unbelievable. It's an actual space shuttle, the Space Shuttle Discovery, right here in front of my eyes. And it's, I think, bigger than I would have expected it to be. These are those tiles that they talk about that help protect it against the heat of re-entry. And it looks like you can see, you can see where it re-entered the atmosphere right here kind of burn those tiles up just a little bit. There it is, discovery. So there were six space shuttles in the space shuttle program um, while it was in operation. Uh, the first flight was in 1977 and the last flight was actually by this one in uh, 2011. That was when they retired the space shuttle program. But this was the last one that was in space. Space shuttle discovery. Here is the discovery from the back side. Trying to get a picture of those engines back there. on the back wing, the underside of the wing of the Discovery. And again, you can see each one of those little tiles there that protected the, the ship from, you know, blowing up on entry. Um, fortunately, obviously, it's still here. The Discovery made it through all of its missions. 
uh, one of which though the Columbia did burn up upon re-entry. I don't know if it was because the tiles failed or what happened, but it never made it back. He killed all seven people that were on the, the ship at the time. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all. One of the things too I read that people point out on um, not only this, but I think the other aircraft as well is the backwards American flag. On the other side, I'm gonna go back on the other side just to confirm this, but they hang it this way because the flag is supposed to be pointed in the, the direction of the wind. So since the wind would obviously be coming from the front of the aircraft back this way, um, it would make sense that the flag would be blowing in the wind in that direction. So that's why it is, it's tradition. So that's why the flag is actually backwards on this, on this, side, of, on the, this side of the shuttle. This Space Shuttle Discovery flew 39 missions from 1984 to 2011 when the program ended. And one of the interesting things about that we've noticed, I didn't really um, know this before, but if you look at these tiles, every single tile on the front of this, I think throughout the entire, um, yeah, throughout the entire ship, every single tile has a number and it has a label. So it seems that if there was an issue or a problem with one of them uh, during any of the flights, before or after any of the flights, they were able to pinpoint exactly the location on this thing where there was an issue. Yeah, see, there it is. There's the American flag on this side. It is flying the correct direction. And that is in the direction of the wind from the front of the ship to the back of the ship. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that. So if any of you ever wonder why that's a backward flag on the other side, that's the reason. I think they have a, a room here where you can observe them working on these oh, really? planes. Yeah, that's what they're doing there putting them together, I guess restoring them, just putting them, I guess getting them ready for, no. It's okay. <laughs> That's Jennifer. She's, she doesn't not really want to be on the camera, so I'm trying to be, to keep her off. But anyways, so it looks like this is an, a, a, a room where they just restore all the stuff, and we just happen to look in the window, and what do we see but an X-Wing fighter. Star Wars. That is amazing. You can see the little, the little hole right there where the R2 unit would go into. <laughs> that is so awesome. So this plane I'm about to show you here is a very historic plane. Very, very historic plane. It, it, it carries a huge significance in our history. In, in, in world history. Um, it is the plane that dropped the atomic bomb Little Boy over Hiroshima back in 1945. It's called the Enola Gay. They have a pretty cool photograph of the cockpit. Take a look at this. This here is the top of the Enola Gay. We just had to come up on the second level, and it's a little bit tricky getting around in this museum, to be honest with me, but you can see down in the cockpit there. It's pretty powerful to be in a, the presence of a plane like this that, that really has had such a profound you know, impact on our history. And again, like I said before, the history of the world, not just American history, the history of the world. One of the last planes I really wanted to see while I was here that they have in this, in this giant museum um, is a very fast plane I used to travel 
you know all around the world very quickly but it was very very expensive to buy a ticket for and apparently the 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 seats were very small and it was terribly uncomfortable to fly in but it got you um you know from the united states to europe in about a quarter of the time as it does or it did with you know a a, a standard airplane this is the concord and it's plane program was stopped many years ago apparently there was an issue with one of them um, I believe it burned up I'm not exactly sure what happened I'm gonna go down and check out a sign I'm sure there's some sort of information down there but this was one of this was one of the fastest passenger planes in the world I think it was the fastest passenger plane in the world uh, but unfortunately they just don't fly them anymore cool plane though sign here this was the this Concorde was the first supersonic airliner um, that flew passengers at twice the speed of sound for over 25 years it could carry up to a hundred passengers and it looks like its downfall was the fact that the fares were super expensive and that because of that there was a shrinking market so um, they started to reduce the flights until all of them were retired in 2003 but this thing would go twice the speed of sound that's pretty damn quick the airplane engines were made by Rolls-Royce. We were looking for an F-14 Tomcat and didn't realize we were standing above one. So before we go, we are gonna have to go down and uh, take a better look at it. This is the, if you ever saw Top Gun, this is the type of plane they were flying in Top Gun, F-14 Tomcat. Ooh, yeah, we're gonna get down there and check that out. All right, so here it is. This is the plane that, well, not the plane, but the type of plane that, that was flown in that movie Top Gear, Top Gear from way back in the days, F-14 Tomcat. This guy's name is Thumper. This is another Rico. Well, this is kind of interesting. It looks like these things were were manufactured from 1969 to 1991 and were made in service to 2006. So these planes were in service through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 37 years the Tomcat flew. These are such cool planes. I love these planes. 